Welcome to Village Church Online. My name is Jeremy. I'm senior pastor here at Village Church, and I am so glad that you've chosen to join us here. Now, we want to know who you are. If you're engaging with us online, we want to know you. So why don't you reach out to us so that we can figure out how to connect you better here at Village Church? Or maybe you have questions about our church that we could answer for you. Whatever it is, you can get in touch with us by emailing us, visiting our website, uh, and going to thisisvillagechurch.com slash connect with us. Now, why don't you join me as we listen to Pastor Fanu continue our series on 2 Corinthians in chapter 8. Welcome to Village Church, everyone. Uh, my name is Fanu. I get to serve as one of the pastors here uh, at Village. And welcome to you from across all of our locations and online. And if you are new with us, a uh, special welcome to you. We are in our series uh, in the book of 2 Corinthians. There's so much that we've been able to unpack uh, over the past many weeks about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, what it means to, uh, to be a disciple, what does it mean to actually know who Jesus is, not just initially falling in love with him and all of the stuff he's done for us, he died for us, eternal life, yes, that's all great, but how do we actually live day in and day out as followers of Christ? And so uh, today we're going to be in uh, chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians. Corinthians, and uh, we're going to work our way down from verse 7 uh, onwards. And, you know, part of what we do at Village, guys, is we, we basically read through the Scripture and teach it verse by verse. So, of course, whatever, uh, you know, the, the text is talking about is what we unpack. And, and last week and this week and over the next couple of weeks, Paul is talking to the church in Corinth about their giving, about their generosity. And so uh, we're talking about it uh, in the context of what does it mean for us as a church to be people of generosity, people who are generous uh, with our, obviously our finances, but with our time, our service, with the perspectives we have uh, of the world, thinking about God, you've given me so much to steward and manage in my life. How do I do this well? So uh, verse 7 of chapter 8 says this, but as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. So he's talking about this idea of excelling, of being excellent, of being somebody that goes over and above. The, the idea here in the, in the Greek, uh, the word is periseo, and periseo basically means to overflow, to have super abundance, uh, to, to exceed expectations, to go over and above. Paul is saying, listen guys, I, I, here's what I want to do first. I want to commend you on how you're living out your life for Christ. Like when it comes to your faith, when it comes to your speech, when it comes to knowledge, when it comes to earnestness and love, and the, your hospitality, uh, your, your understanding of scripture, your, your trust in God, your, your articulation of the gospel. Guys, you're doing great. You're excelling. You are uh, super abounding. You are overflowing. But I also want you to do the same thing when it comes to your giving. He talks about this also in verse 2 when he uh, talked to, about the Macedonian church. And Pastor Michael unpacked it so beautifully last week. If you haven't watched that sermon, you should go back and watch it. And he basically says to the Corinthian church about the Macedonians, he says, guys, these guys were going through affliction and they were going through extreme poverty. But here's what happened. Here's how they responded. They responded with abundant joy and they responded with generosity. It's sort of counterintuitive. It's like, how does that make sense? How can you be afflicted and in poverty, but your response is joy and generosity? Well, because there's this, this work of Christ that's happening in our hearts. If you are a follower of Jesus, this is the work that Christ does in you. That regardless of your circumstances, your perspective is not temporal, it's eternal. But I get it. it it's, it's not one of those things that we um, naturally do uh, in our world, in the culture we live in, right? Pariseo, it's, it's the idea of uh, abundance. I mean, we have abundance of stuff, but not always abundance of giving or generosity, right? If you want to know how much stuff you have, uh, all you need to do is uh, get ready to sell your home. As some of you know, we're in the process of moving from Toronto to, uh, to Vancouver area. And uh, our house is on the market right now. So I was home for about a week. And, the, and my job for the week, basically, for my wife was get the house in order. And so my realtor came and said, listen, you need to get all the extra stuff. I mean, you can leave the closets with, with you know, clothes and stuff. That's okay. As long as it's not overflowing. 
okay? As long as it's not like our stuff is all over the place. And so I was like, oh, that shouldn't be too hard. Until and unless I opened up the closets. I went into the garage. I went into the shed in the backyard. Guys, you know what I realized I had done? I was so convicted all of all the extra stuff I would bought over the years that I wasn't going to use. So what I did is I hid them away. I was like, if I don't see it, I won't feel guilty. But now I'm like, I got to take literally multiple U-Haul trips to a storage unit because we have so much stuff. So many toys for the kids, like some stuff my girls have barely even played with. Because, you know, you just feel bad. It's Christmas. It's their birthday. I'm going back from Surrey after a week. I better buy them something. Right? Paraseo, you're overflowing with stuff. And that's the human condition. That's the human propensity. That's, that's how we're wired. The other day, I was sending out my wife. I, I, I bought some stuff in Surrey. Now that I'm, you know, here more often, I'm like, oh, I should probably get accustomed to where the malls are at, you know, and what the shopping's like and stuff. So I ended up sending her a couple of, uh, um, you know, outfits and stuff that I, I bought, jackets and stuff, and I sent it to her and say, hey, what do you think? Does it look good? Whatever. And so she initially says, yeah, it looks great. Then she calls me. She's like, wait a minute. Is that new? I said, yeah, but, but it was on sale. This is my answer to every time she asks. I said, it was on sale. I said, baby, it was 100. See, I'm one of those people, right? It's like, it's 150 bucks. It's on sale for 100 bucks. In my mind, as I walk out of the store, I just made $50. This is great, right? And of course, it's genetic. It's that Indian gene I have in me. You give me a discount, I'll buy anything. If you want to sell stuff to me, all you have to do, raise it by 50%, drop it by 25. I will walk out of there not only purchasing it, but with a smile on my face. I'm like, this was the best deal ever. But I said, we buy, and this is why the storage uh, unit industry is like in the billions of dollars. Because we literally have no space in our homes to store the stuff we buy. But Paul says, I want you to excel, not in gaining more stuff, but in giving stuff away. And then he says, and I love this, because he doesn't just talk about what you need to do. See, listen, if you listen to the sermon, and you don't know Christ, I, I'm sure you'll, well, well, somebody else telling me what I need to do with my life, what I need to do with my money. I, I don't really know how to do this. This is the whole point. Well, Paul tells us, here's how you do it. It's an act of grace. Charis, the idea of the grace of God. See, here's how generosity works for a Christ follower. You experience the grace of God you receive the grace of God, and then here's what you do. You disperse the grace of God. You distribute the grace of God to those around you. See, generosity is like a thermometer of the grace of God that's working in you. Here's the question. Based on your generosity today, how much of God's grace is working in your life right now? Based on how much you're able to give a way to serve people, to meet needs, to allow people to experience God, God's goodness through your life. How much of God's grace is working in you? And of course, when we think about giving, when we think about God's grace, it's like, well, practically, what does this look like? I want to talk to you about four kinds of giving, okay? Just to make this as applicable as possible. One is the idea of spontaneous giving. Uh, this is when you hear about a need. You hear about someone that's going through something, some, some organization that's trying to help some people that are in need. And you are moved. And you want to make a difference. And, and you want to give towards that. It's not planned, but, but it's, it's something that sort of moves your heart. And you're like, I got to do something to get involved. A great example is uh, a few months ago, our Langley South location. Uh, they had a goal of raising $5,000 uh, for City Dental that was helping people who don't have access to uh, dental services in the Langley area. And you know what's amazing? Not only did they raise the 5000 they raised $22,000. Isn't that amazing? Come on. $22,000 as a church. I was spontaneous. Like, hey, here's a need. Would you give? Now, of course, what happens when you think of a spontaneous giving is people say, well, I will pray about it. And that's a great strategy. Your giving should always begin with prayer. But here's something that I think will be helpful for us as we think about how do we do this well. Uh, one author says this about hearing God. He says, hearing God as, re as a reliable day-to-day -day reality for people with good sense is for those who are devoted to the glory of God and the advancement of his kingdom. It is for the disciple of Jesus Christ who, is who has no higher preference than to be like him. 
See, he says, if you want to hear God's voice, if that's the strategy, I need to pray and hear from God what I need to give towards uh, an initiative, a mission, an organization, a need. He says, what you need to make sure you're doing is that Christ is at the center. Christ is at the throne of your heart. He goes on to say, if we do not want to be converted from our chosen and habitual ways, if we really want to run our own lives without any interference from God, our very perceptual mechanisms will filter out his voice or twist it to our own purposes. He says, if we actually don't care about honoring God with our life, with our resources, if we don't actually want to be about the mission of God with our lives, he says, what's going to happen is you're going to perceive in your own mind, in a certain way, you're going to look at your finances, you're going to look at the need in a certain way that you're not going to hear the voice of God. You're actually going to exclude God's voice. So if you, if you want to be better at spontaneous giving, compassionate giving, say, Lord, I want you to be at the center of my heart. I want you to be at the throne of my heart. I want everything I do to ultimately bring glory to you. Secondly, it's this idea of consistent giving. So not just spontaneous giving, but consistent giving. Isaiah 32, 8 in the New uh, Living Translation says this, but generous people plan to do what is generous, and they stand firm in their generosity. The idea being, if you want to be someone that's generous, you've got to practice generosity. It can't happen in, in starts and spurts and stops. Here and there, you give a little, give, give a little when there's a need, give a little when there's compassion. But if you really want to be generous, you've got to be consistent, right? It's like my health journey. As most of you know, I'm not doing really well. Some of you still ask me what I'm doing about my F45 days. It's like gone, guys. It's not happening. You know why? This is my problem. I start and I stop. I get really excited, do it for a few weeks, and then I don't, I'm not consistent. And the idea of consistent giving is that you're building the muscle of being generous. You're training yourself to say, how do I consistently give towards something that's going to make a long-term impact, going to make a difference in the lives of people in the long run? Gen giving is what we do, but generous is who we are. Giving is not just an action, but is an action, but generosity is a mindset. And the idea of consistent giving is we want to build into that mindset. And in the context of a church, this is why it's really important. You know, I was uh, uh, at the uh, worship night that we did for the sites in the Lower Mainland um, this week. And uh, it was fantastic. If you were there, you know it was fantastic. We had standing room only, um, hundreds and hundreds of people worshiping Jesus. It was awesome. And standing next to me, uh, you know, in the front of the church was a whole bunch of young people, right? And I was so impressed, guys. I was so impressed by how they were worshiping, how they were praying. They were praying for each other. Uh, some of them were like, had tears in their eyes. They were confessing to each other. They were praying. It was just the way they were worshiping, I was inspired to really worship, just watching them worship. So at the end of the service, I was talking to someone, and I said, you know, I'm so impressed how God really moved in the lives of these young people at this service. And then someone said to me, he said, they said, oh, Finu, you, you know, probably don't know this yet. Uh, th these young people actually from our church show up to this venue, to this space every single Tuesday night. Like they actually have services here. Where, where staff and volunteer leaders are teaching them what it means to be followers of Jesus, where they're worshiping and practicing worship. They are praying and learning how to pray. And I'm like, this happens every single week? Yes. See, that's the thing about consistent giving. That's the thing about consistent ministry is that it's not just a one-off. You're actually building into the lives of people. And when you consistently give, you have a part to play in that ministry. The question, you know, that's sort of typically asked is, if you're part of our church, if you're new, if you're a skeptic, if you're not a Christian, this isn't for you. But if, you're, if you call Village Church home, is are you a guest still or are you part of the family? Are you sort of just in the crowd still or are you really part of our church and on mission with us? Because if you are, then consistent giving becomes part of your pattern of worship. Number three is proportionate giving. Malachi 3, 8 to 10 says, Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. Verse 10, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. 
and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. This idea of proportionate giving. Paul talks about it in chapter 8 and chapter 9 in the book of Corinthians. He says, don't give what you don't have. Give from what you do have. And in the Old Testament, there was this law, there was this principle of giving the tithe, which is the 10%. So you would bring 10% of whatever you got from the field if you were a farmer. And you would bring it the, the first, the first fruits, the first of your harvest. 10%, you would bring it to God. And it's the only time in Scripture God literally says, test me, test me if I will not honor your giving. Proportional giving. It's not, it's not about the amount. Uh, you know, I, this is something that I was sort of raised in um, growing up in the church and you know, I, I remember, I, I would literally, we would walk to church on Thursday nights, and uh, our main services were on Thursday nights in the Middle East, and, and there would be days when I'd walk halfway to church, and I'd remember I'd forgotten to bring an offering. And it was so part of our rhythm that you don't go to church empty-handed that we would go back home, and we would say, Mom, forgot the offering, and they would, she would give us cash. Back then it was all cash, and we'd go back to church. It was this idea that we've got to bring something. It doesn't matter what the amount is. But it's, it's proportional to what you have. I, as I was going through the, all of my documents, you know, we're clearing out our house and um, filing cabinets and stuff. I saw, you know, uh, pay stubs and stuff from when I first started in ministry, right? I was making like $500 a month or something, right? It was crazy. And, and, and I remember, and I was just looking at the pay stubs and I was thinking, I was remembering. Even when I used to make just $500 a month, I would just take 50 because it was part of my rhythm, part of my service. I just take 50 and I'd put it away. i say, God, this is for you. The first is for you. Today, the numbers are so much bigger, but it's proportional to what we make. Now, there are some, of course, that will say, and rightfully so, well, this is not a law in the New Testament. Jesus came and he paid the price, and we're not bound by the laws of percentages from the Old Testament. And it's true. We're not. So it doesn't matter today if the decision you make as you hear the sermon is, I want to give 5%, I want to give 2%, I'm going to 15%. That's not the point. The question is this, though. Is there a proportionate giving that you are committed to in your worship to Jesus. You know, one author, he was talking about this idea of like the tension, right? It's easy to just go, well, it's just 10% because that's what the Old Testament says. But the reality is, well, it, it doesn't apply to us anymore. How do you deal with that? And here's what he says. Listen, he says, being under grace does not mean living by lower standards than the law. Christ systematically addressed such issues as murder, adultery, and the taking of oaths and made it clear that his standards were much higher than those of the Pharisees. That's basically the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. He never lowered the bar. He always raised it. But he also empowers us. Here's, hear this word. By his grace. He empowers us by his grace to jump higher than the law demands. Like, like it's, it's not about the amount is what he's saying. You know, this is why, you know, we grew up this way, right? In Indian culture, when you go to weddings and stuff, um, the way it works is everyone keeps tabs on what you bring. Okay, so meaning if your son or daughter got married in the Indian family, okay, your son or daughter got married and you invited basically your whole neighborhood, that's how it works, okay, so there's hundreds of people and, and they all come, right, and they bring something, right, they give you some, some, a gift towards the wedding, towards the couple and stuff. And what happens is you make a note of what they gave. When they invite you to their kid's wedding, five years later, you open up the big binder with all the wedding gifts and you say, let me look at what whoever, Kumar, you know, some mini guy, Kumar gave when our son got married. And then what you do is, and so your wife's like, honey, come on, $125? Come on. You know, are you serious? They gave us only $100. i am including inflation at $25. <laughs> they should be happy. My understanding is Italians do the same thing. I don't know, okay? I'm not Italian, but I've heard. My point is this, because here's the thing though, but maybe they didn't have as much as you had. Maybe 100 for them was equal to 500 for you because they make so much less than you do. So God is not concerned about the specific amount. He's talking about proportionality. And lastly, radical generosity. And this is what the Macedonians did. Again, if you read the first part of this chapter that Pastor Michael preached on, in their poverty... Paul literally said to them, guys, don't give. What are you doing? Don't give. You, you, you have nothing. They said, no, 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 please. It literally says they begged for the opportunity to give. See, radical generosity is when Jesus stood and he looked at the people that were coming to worship at the temple and bringing their offerings. 
And the Bible says there was a bunch of rich people that came. And they gave good amounts. They were, they were generous people. But then there was this widow who, he, who gave two mites. Basically, these coins are the size of a, like a pencil eraser. Okay, they're like the lowest denomination coins in those days. It's worth like, I don't know, like half an hour's worth of work. Like it's nothing. But Jesus looks at it and he says, she's given more than everyone else. The disciples are like, what are you talking about? He says, well, they gave out of the abundance of what they had. But she gave everything she had. There are those moments but for some of us, God will call us to radical generosity. Where it's not just, hey, use the rent rental income of this property to give. It's actually sell the property and give the proceeds. Again, that's something that God has to speak to you about. But, but my point is this. There are moments when this happens. I remember when I was starting in ministry, um, <laughs> Sister Maria, I called her Sister Maria. She was in her 70s back then already. It's going back 10, 15 years. Little old Portuguese lady, loved me so much, loved my ministry so much, helped us go around the world. She started off giving monthly, very small amounts, but then eventually she kept increasing, increasing, every year increasing it. And once I said to her, Maria, you need to stop. I know you cannot keep doing this. God has blessed us with other donors, other supporters. We don't need this from you. You don't have to keep raising it. You need to stop. Can you imagine telling her, stop. And she got so upset at me. She was a little, little old lady, like, like that, that, that high. She'd hold my finger. It's like, don't you stop me from being a blessing to the people where you go and minister, she would say. And she would explain to me, she was not, you know, dumb, she was smart. She said, let me tell you how I've organized my finances to make this possible. She passed away a few years ago, and I, I think about her, you know, I just get emotional about it because it's like, no one knows. No one knew Maria was giving to us. But she cared so much about the mission of God. I was in Ottawa last year for a leaders meeting. Uh, leaders across Canada, business leaders, ministry leaders. And they were sharing the story of this UK couple. Really wealthy. Sold a business for hundreds of millions of dollars. And their commitment to the Lord was they would take the profits, put it into a foundation... And every year, the returns on the investment of that money would go towards evangelism around the world. My point is this. You can be rich. And you could think, man, I'm, I'm not rich at all. I'm poor. But radical generosity can happen wherever you are. What matters is that your heart is listening to what the Lord wants you to do. In verse 8, Paul says this. I say this not as a command. This is so important. It's just, this will not work. Generosity does not work if you feel guilt around it. It's not how it's supposed to work. He says it's not by command, but to prove the earnestness of, of others that your love is genuine. He says this is what matters. Do you have genuine love? See, genuine love causes you to give. I, I was talking to my daughters uh, yesterday and, uh, you know, FaceTiming them. And uh, it's my birthday in a few days, right? And so they're talking about my birthday and all the plans. And Lauren's like, my older one's like, you know, Daddy, we're going to go get the card for you. And we're going to get a present for you and all this stuff. And then the little one, she doesn't want to be left out, the three-year-old Catherine. She's like, Daddy, I make cake for you. I said, What? Catherine, how are you going to... My wife is rolling her eyes because, of course, that means she's got to make the cake, right? But Catherine is determined. I'm sure she'll stir the batter or something. She is determined to make cake for me for my birthday. Why? Because she loves me. See, love causes us to want to give. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 15. Listen to what the love of Christ does. Listen. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Listen to what Paul's saying. Because of what Jesus did, the love of Christ, it controls us. Man, that is so offensive to our culture, isn't it? Contro I don't want to be controlled. Oh yeah, if you love Jesus, you will be controlled. You will be controlled by love. Your time will be controlled. Your money will be controlled. Your talent will be controlled. Everything about you will be under the control of the love of God. 
Here's the question, do you love him? I, I remember years ago, I was, uh, I was uh, going to preach. I was preaching in, uh, I won't name the country. It's a developing nation around the world. And uh, I was there. We were doing some ma massive evening rallies. Tens of thousands of people were going to be there. And we had basically paid for that part of the trip. But the part we hadn't paid for yet, and we were hoping to raise money locally, was for pa a pastor's conference. Three to 400 pastors were being bussed in from villages all around that city. And they were going to come. We were going to accommodate them. We are going to give them accommodations for three days. We are going to feed them for three days. And a couple of days before I was supposed to leave from Toronto, Toronto, my organizer in that country called me and said, Pastor Fanu, I'm sorry, I don't know how we're going to do this pastor's conference. We don't have enough money. We haven't received the donations. I said, what are you talking about? I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to contact every Christian business owner and professional in that city, and I want you to invite them to a dinner that I'm going to host at this hotel that I'm staying, at the meeting room. And so I land there in the afternoon. In the evening, I walk into this room, and I basically talk to these guys who are basically, in their context, they are well off. In their context, they own businesses. In their context, they're doctors and engineers and lawyers and professionals. Government officers were in the room. All of these people. And here's what I said to them. I said, guys, do you love your nation? Do you love your city? Do you love these people we are going to minister to who Jesus died for? Do you love the pastors who basically have given up everything in this world? They are persecuted. They are living in villages, in slums around the city, serving Jesus faithfully. Do you love those people or not? In 45 minutes to an hour, I had raised all the money I needed for that pastor's conference. Literally, people started getting them. I'll do this. I'll, I'll donate so much. I'll bring all the rice. I'll bring all the chicken. I'll take care of the accommodation bill. I, I didn't talk about money. I never mentioned dollars. I don't even understand that currency exchange. I just talked about love. Do you love Jesus? Because see, sometimes you need to be inspired. Because their problem was they were so used to the Americans and the Canadians funding everything. I said, yeah, we love your people. We do. That's why we are doing this. But how much do you love your people? And, you know, I've had people all over the 20 years of ministry, people said to me, no, I don't know. Like, oh, do you like to talk about money? And I don't need that. I was like, I love talking about money. It's the best thing ever. Because it's, it's like, so if I wasn't a preacher, guys, my dream would have been an entrepreneur to start a business and to get on Shark Tank, to start on the, stand on the carpet in Shark Tank and pitch to Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful. That would be my dream. I'd be like, oh, let's go. I got a product. I've got a company. He's going to kill me on my valuation. He's going to ask me for a crazy royalty and th until he gets three times his money. I get it. But I would love to go back and forth with him a little bit. You know why? I know if I ever got there, I would be proud of the product I have. I would be proud of the company I built. I would be excited about the, the investment opportunity that he would have to invest in my company so that we can reach more people with that product. Listen, what greater product in the world is there? What greater message in the world is there? What or greater organization in the world is there than the church of Jesus? It's not temporal. It's eternal. It's not just for now. It's for eternity. It's not just trying to change people on the outside. It's trying to change people people on the inside. I get excited talking about investing in the kingdom of God. Let's go. Let's go. Listen, listen. Why you know, people say, aren't, aren't you, do you, you feel shy? Listen, don't you feel bad asking? I said, Can you, if Jeff Bezos asked you to drain out most of your retirement to invest in Amazon in 1999, would, we, would he be apologizing to you today? For the 5% he gave you of Amazon? Would he? Absolutely not. You know why? Because he thinks it's worth the investment. He believed then and he believes now he will become the, Amazon will be the greatest retailer in the world. I believe that the gospel of Jesus is the greatest answer in the world. I believe that Jesus alone can solve the challenges we face in society today. I believe that God can transform the heart of any person who comes into contact with the gospel and the grace of Jesus. And if I do, why would I shy away from inviting people to give their time, their energy, their talents, their treasure for the sake of that message? And finally, in verse 9, here's what Paul says. Excuse me. Go back here. Start of verse 9. 
For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. You know what Paul does? He takes it all the way back. He says, you know why? You know why I'm so pumped about this? You know why I'm asking you to give generously? Because the guy you and I follow, he gave up everything. He literally emptied himself. That's what, that's what the scriptures say. Let me, let me read this for you. Philippians 2, 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Paul says he emptied himself. Hey, can I, can I say this? Jesus didn't give you 10% of his life. He didn't give you 10% of his blood. He gave you everything. I don't know if you guys have heard of this guy. His name is Charles Feeney. He um, started the duty-free shops, you know, the duty-free shops, the chain, all over the world. He was a billionaire, multi-multi-billionaire. When he became really rich, he said his goal was that he wanted to give away all of his money before he died. And so September 14th of 2020, Atlantic Philanthropies shut down their offices. They shut down their offices because they had given away all of the money they plan to give by the year 2020. They estimate it to be $8 billion. Charles died a few months ago, meaning he lived three years being a small, 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 small percentage of the wealth that he had most of his life. They say he has built buildings worth $2.7 billion around the world not one of the buildings has his name on it. Imagine meeting Charles in 2001, oh, sorry, 2021. Imagine what you would say to him. Bro, are you serious? You were a billionaire and you gave it all away? You emptied yourself? Like, how crazy would that be for us? Just think about it. Guys, that's what Jesus did. Not even, he's not $8 billion, the king of heaven. The Lord of all lords, the Lord of lords, the King of kings, the creator of the universe. He emptied himself, Paul says. But it's not just emotional. It's not just, well, look at that. And because of that, won't you be moved to give? No, 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 that's not how it works. Paul says, if you're in Christ, you are a new creation. The old things have passed away. All things have become new. So because Jesus died, because he became poor, how did he become poor? By becoming human, by suffering like us, by dying on the cross, because he shed his blood. You know what we get? We get to be new creations. We get to be new kinds of people. So the other day, watch this, the other day, I went to a nursery, okay? Now, if you told me that you went to a nursery, I would think that meant, you know where they have kids, like childcare nursery? That's what I would think. But this is not that kind of nursery, okay? I went to a nursery where they grow plants, where they grow seedlings. So fascinating. Love the experience. Now, when I was there, I saw this, I was looking at these plants, and they have a little green tab on them. And so I said to the gentleman who's the owner, I said, hey, um, what are these green tabs? He says, well, this is what we do, Finu. He says, we, we like the stem of the plant. That's where the fruit is produced. But, but the roots are usually not very strong. So what we do is we, we grow strong roots separately. And then we, we graft the stem onto the stronger root so that now the fruit that comes from the stem is so much more fuller, richer, bigger, whatever. Like it's better because of the new root that it is attached to. It was so fascinating. I said, can I please try? And they let me. 
They give me a little blade. You have to take the stem. You have to cut it in a 45-degree angle. And I messed that up. I murdered a few plants, honestly. I did. I had to murder a few plants, but eventually I got it right. And then I put it together. It was fascinating doing it. And you know what I thought as I was preparing the sermon? That's what Jesus does for us. The selfish root of human existence does not let you be generous. Does not let you give away stuff. Because it wants to hoard. It wants more, more, more. Nothing will ever be enough. As I've said in the, in the day, you know, in a sermon many, many, many months ago, you know, I used to shop in certain grocery stores. Okay? As we made more money, guess what? Same tomatoes, but now they're presented in a better box. Same cucumbers, but the lighting looks so much better as the cucumbers reflect back to me. <laughs> right? Same canned food, but oh, now the aisles are wider and it's cleaner. The tiles are cleaner. Right? That's what we do. We keep upgrading. It's never enough. But when you're connected to the root of Jesus, you begin to operate in a way that people say, you must be crazy. You must have lost your mind. What are you doing giving away so much? What are you doing not buying that new car, buying that second house, buying that boat? Why? You have it. Why don't you use it? I'll close with this quote by C.S. Lewis from Mere Christianity. Listen carefully. Give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose your life and you will save it. Submit to death. Death to your ambitions and favorite wishes every day and death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being and you will find eternal life. Keep nothing back. Nothing that you have not given away will be really yours. Let me read that again. Nothing that you have not given away will be really yours. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ and you will find Him and with Him everything else thrown in. Here's the question I want to ask you today. In this room, rooms across our country and online, do you know Jesus? Have you received the grace of Jesus through his death on the cross, his immeasurable grace, his uncontainable love, his unending mercy for your life and my life? Generosity is not a command. It's an appeal. If you love Jesus, would you give spontaneously? Would you give consistently? Would you give proportionately? Would you give radically? If you're part of our church and you don't do that, you're not giving consistently. You're not giving proportionally. I want to challenge you. At the beginning of a year, would you consider saying, Lord, I want to test you in this. I want to be generous. I want to invest. Talked to a gentleman the other day. Incredible story of salvation. On the streets, on drugs, only person in his family that now knows Jesus. Unbelievable. Just walked into the church on a Sunday, found a community, changed his life, got baptized, serves right now. I think of the prison ministry we do. Every week, we go into the prison in Surrey. Multiple people from that prison have come out of the prison and now come to our church. They, they will watch the sermon in the prison system. They're opening up more cells for us. Would you consider this worth investing in for the sake of the gospel of Jesus? Let's pray. Father, thank you for speaking to us today through your word. I pray that we would not just be hearers of the word, but we would be doers of the word, walking in obedience, walking in love, walking in generosity. In Jesus' name.
bridges to the land And all who've gone before us And all who will believe Will sing the song of ages to the land Your name is the highest Your name is the greatest Your name
the lamb is overcome we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah the lamb is overcome we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah the lamb is overcome we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah the lamb is overcome we sing hallelujah. 